On Monday, April 11, 1981, in one of Chicago's banks, the attendant opened the bank vault, and everything was just fine. Shortly after, a client came in and asked to open her safety deposit box. The attendant accompanied her to the vault, but when they put the keys on the lock, they were surprised when the lock cylinder fell into the box. Then they would discover that 74 boxes were broken too. There was no trace of any hole or opening. Everything appeared normal. How did the thieves get into the vault? That's what we are going to figure out in today's video. Today's story takes place in a town named Barrington, a small town in Chicago. In this town, there was only one bank, which was a branch of the Federal Bank, the First National Bank. At that time, the bank vaults were on a time lock. That is to say, the bankers had to calculate the amount of time the vault should remain locked, and once the door is locked, no one can bypass it, even if he has the keys. For example, if the working hours end at 5 p.m. and start at 9 a.m., the bankers have to calculate the time in between, which is 16 hours, and then program the vault not to open until after 16 hours, during which no one can open the safe even if they have the key or pin. The same thing goes for the weekends. The bank used to work part-time on Saturday, meaning that after the end of the morning period, they used to lock the vault and set it to be opened on Monday morning. On Saturday, April 11, 1981, the attendant in charge of the vault locked the door and set it to be opened Monday morning. After the weekend, the bankers went back to their normal work on Monday morning, April 13, 1981. The attendant in charge entered the pin and unlocked the vault. Everything appeared to be normal. The vaults contain many safe deposit boxes in which people keep their valuable items. Each safe has two keys, one for the attendant in charge and one for the owner of the safe box, and the two keys must be used to open the safe box. On that morning, everything was going great until one of the safe deposit box owners came to the bank. She told the banker that she wanted to open her own safe box. The attendant in charge took her and entered the vault. They both put their keys in the box, and the cylinder locks fell into the box, which means that the safe box lock was broken. They opened the box and found it robbed. The attendant began to check the other safe deposit boxes to find out that there were 74 broken and robbed safe deposit boxes. The vault didn't appear to have been robbed. Even the broken locks were in place, but it would fall as soon as it was touched. It seemed that the robbers made an effort to hide their robbery. They didn't want the bankers to discover the robbery immediately, but the question is why. The bank management informed the police, who began their investigation straight away. And due to the fact that it was a federal bank, the FBI conducted an investigation as well. The officers found out that the robbers stole properties worth more than $1 million. The crime scene puzzled the officers. They had been wondering how the thieves managed to get in. There was no hole or opening, and the vault door was locked without any damage. They also found evidence that raised their confusion. They had found an old alarm clock, the tools used to break the safe boxes, like a hammer and pliers, and a bottle filled with urine. Despite all the efforts made by the investigators, they were unable to find a lead that would help them solve the mystery of the case. The local newspapers literally described the robbery as the perfect crime. What appeared to be strange was that the perfect crime was actually the work of one person. He was a hairdresser, his name was William Smarto, and he was literally smart. He was a serial bank robber. He carried out many robberies, but this was the largest and the most successful. He used to work as a hairdresser at a ladies' salon. Although it was a profitable job, it seems that the guy was ambitious. He wanted a bigger challenge and was ready to take risks. He carried out the robbery almost on his own, with the small help of his brother Vincent. The two brothers were looking for potential targets together. They targeted banks located in wealthy areas because they were likely to find safety deposit boxes with valuable items. When they discovered Barrington and found that bank, they knew that this was the right target they were looking for. The two brothers entered the bank and began talking to the attendant in charge of the bank vault. 
Smarto was attractive and a man with communication skills by which he could deceive anybody. They rented a box under a fake name, and the two of them used to go to the bank frequently, attempting to familiarize themselves with the vault attendant by chatting with her until they became friends. In parallel, they were monitoring her movements and behaviors, including when she takes a break and how she behaves. We can say that they focused more on human weaknesses than technical weaknesses in the bank. This is one of the methods used by thieves and hackers, which is called social engineering, which refers to all techniques aimed at talking a target into revealing specific information or performing a specific action for illegitimate reasons. As it was previously mentioned, Smarto and his brother used to go to the bank together. When the vault was opened, the door remained open. When the safe box owner came, the attendant checked his identity, went with him to open his safe box, and left the vault in order to give the client some privacy. Vincent, the young brother, used to chat with the attendant, while Smarto stayed inside the vault, checking it, examining the safety deposit boxes, and discovering what items would help him carry out the operation. The most important thing he discovered was that the attendants check the identity only at the entry, while at the exit, the client leaves the bank normally. The next step was that Smarto needed to get his tools into the vault, and the best place to hide them was his safety deposit box. So he brought his tools in a bag, and the vault attendant accompanied him to his box, opened the box with him, and left to give him privacy. Smarto started putting his tools inside his box. Of course, he did not bring all his tools at once, but he brought them one by one so that no one would suspect him. His box was full of tools, and he still needed to bring other tools, some of which were so large that they could not enter the box even if it was empty. He got the idea of telling the bank attendants that he is an artifact and painting dealer so he could bring larger bags. However, he still had the problem of where to put the big tools. He noticed that the vault had a false ceiling, so he took advantage of the space over the ceiling to keep his items. He brought the tools, lights, food, and everything else he would need during the operation. Smarto then had to deal with the alarm system. But the alarm was just a sound sensor. Its only task was to prevent anyone from trying to penetrate the vault from the walls or the floor. That is to say, if someone was digging or jackhammering the walls, the alarm would work right away. Although Smarto wasn't intended to get into the vault through walls, floors, or even the ceiling, he had to get rid of the alarm system so that he could break the safe box locks. Fortunately for him, the alarm system wasn't sophisticated, and he was experienced enough in electronics to disable the alarm. All he had to do was damage the sound accumulator to make the alarm useless. Smarto was still afraid of the possibility of the existence of other hidden alarms in the vault, and to make sure that he disabled all the alarms, he put an alarm clock on the ceiling and set it to ring at night by the time the bank was closed. If there were other sound sensors, they would work immediately after the alarm rang, and the police would show up. Smarto kept monitoring the bank to see if the police would come. Indeed, the police arrived to check the bank, and they left when they found nothing suspicious. At that time, Smarto realized that there were other alarms in the vault. During the days after, he looked for the remaining alarms and managed to disable them all. He made the same test for the second time. He put the alarm clock on the ceiling and set it to ring at night, and he went out of the bank. This time, the police didn't show up, so he was sure that all the alarms were disabled. And here comes the toughest part of the whole plan. How would he break in? On Saturday, April 11, 1981, Smarto went to the bank as usual, talked to the vault attendant, and went together to the vault. The attendant opened the box alongside him and left to give him privacy, while his brother, who was there too, was talking to the attendant, trying to distract her. He was even flirting with her. At that moment, Smarto, who was inside the vault, vanished. This is when his true genius was displayed. Smarto didn't choose this bank randomly. They specifically chose the Barrington Bank because of the empty space in the corner that is made when two rows of safety deposit boxes come together, making a dead spot. 
When the attendant left him alone inside the vault, Smarto climbed up on the safety deposit box row and slid down to the corner where he would keep hiding. While the attendant was still busy with his brother Vincent, who was distracting her. As it is mentioned before, the client's identities are only checked at the entry. As a result, the attendant didn't pay attention to Smarto, which was still inside the vault. At the end of the day, she closed it, set it to the time lock, and went for her weekend holiday. Smarto, after it was confirmed that the work was over and everyone had left the bank, he climbed out of the corner, turned on his flashlights, and got out all the tools he needed. It was time to break the locks. This was a very sensitive step. He brought with him stove bolts that were modified and cut to the diameter of the cylinder locks so the hit would line up perfectly in order not to damage the box. He wanted everything to look normal. This way, Smarto kept breaking the locks without damaging their shapes, taking the money and all the valuable items. The process was a bit tiring. Breaking tens of locks in a dark place wasn't easy, so Smarto used to take breaks, eat, and drink to get the energy to resume the work. The fact that the next day was Sunday helped him a lot. He took his time working on the locks. Smarto saw himself as Robin Hood. He steals from the rich and gives to the poor. Depending on the content of the safety boxes, he was able to know who was poor and had debts because some people kept their documents there. So he took some valuable things from other boxes that seemed to belong to rich people and put them inside the boxes of the people he believed were poor. Smarto kept cleaning up the place of anything that might have fallen on the ground. He placed back all the boxes and put back all the lock cylinders. He kept checking the boxes several times to make sure that everything appeared normal. If someone entered the vault, he would see that everything is just fine. The boxes and locks are in place, and nothing is broken or damaged. But if he tried to open a box, the lock cylinder would immediately fall out. Smarto was ready and prepared for everything. He put his tools back above the false ceiling, put the loot inside the bags, and climbed back to hide in that small square at the corner. On Monday morning, April 13, 1981, the bank opened and the attendant came to unlock the vault as usual. She entered and everything appeared normal and nothing looked suspicious. At that time, Smarto used a small mirror to monitor the room. He waited until the attendant left the vault and climbed up disguised as a workman because there was construction work in the bank at the time. So he took advantage of this in his favor and walked out of the bank carrying the loot bags without being noticed. His brother Vincent was waiting for him outside the bank in a car. Smarto came out of the bank and put the loot bags in the car trunk. Due to the fact that the loot was bigger than he could carry it at once, he went back to the bank vault, took the remaining bags, and walked out unnoticed. We can say that this was one of the smartest and most daring bank robberies in history. The FBI investigators examined the vault. They photographed every corner and tried to extract fingerprints, but they found nothing. They were unable to find any leads to follow up on. One of the things that puzzled them was the alarm clock. They didn't understand why such a clock was in the vault. After checking the sound sensors and finding them all disabled, they got the answer. After gathering all the evidence they could get, the FBI investigators were sure the thieves had meticulously planned for this robbery, which means that they rented one of the boxes. So, they checked the box owner's list and managed to confirm that all the people on the list were real except for two, so they concluded that these people are most likely the thieves. Although the FBI took their appearances from the bankers, they were unable to find a lead. Eventually, it remained an open case and an unsolved crime for a long time. A year passed without any updates, but after that year, an incident happened in another town and in another bank, but in Chicago as well. One of those bank clients entered the restroom of the bank, and suddenly a piece of the false ceiling fell down on his head. The client looked up and felt like there was something moving above the ceiling. He went to inform the bank security, and the ladder came and brought a ladder. He climbed up with his flashlight and saw a leg moving up there, so he got scared and immediately informed the police. The police arrived and ordered the guy to get down. 
It was William Smarto. He was above the false ceiling of the restroom because it was next to the bank vault, which apparently was his new target. The police examined the false ceiling space where he was hiding and found tools that are similar to the ones used in the Barrington Bank robbery. The police investigated Smarto, and it turned out that he was a lot more than just a hairdresser. The FBI checked many robberies that might be similar to this one and discovered that there was another robbery that took place one month and a half ago in another town in Chicago. The report of this robbery attempt claimed that there was a man disguised as a workman digging in the bank vault wall, using a drill when a janitor interrupted him. Asking what he was doing, Smarto looked him right in the eye and told him, when I'm done, clean this up, please. Apparently, the janitor believed him. Afterward, Smarto took his tools and vanished immediately. This clearly shows Smarto's personality and how confident he is. Smarto stole more than a million dollars, but why steal again? Is he so greedy? When they asked him why he stole more than one bank, he said he liked the challenge and excitement he gets when robbing, as if playing a game. This is shown, for example, when he was moving valuables to the boxes of people he thought were poor. Smarto's personality was distinctive, not like the rest of the thieves. In the same bank where Smarto was digging the wall, the police discovered an alarm clock above the false ceiling, and the janitor confirmed that he was the man digging the wall. Smarto was then accused of the first robbery, despite the lack of evidence. Everything looked similar. The alarm, the tools, the use of the false ceiling, and even the way. The intelligence in the theft carried out by Smarto made it distinct from any other theft, which turned against him. It became easy to distinguish his operations, Smarto kept denying that he had anything to do with the first robbery, but the judge found him guilty and gave him a 20-year prison sentence. However, the judge told him that his sentence would be reduced if he returned the stolen items. At that time, Smarto was still claiming he was innocent, but when he was sentenced to 20 years, he decided to admit it. Smarto was keeping his loot in a bag that was apparently underwater, maybe in a lake or river because when the lawyer brought it to court, it was wet and smelled very bad. When they opened the bag, they found most of the money and jewelry stolen from Barrington Bank. Smarto returned the loot, and the judge kept his word. His sentence was reduced from 20 years to eight years. But the reduction was subject to a condition. Smarto should inform the FBI how he carried out his operations and tell him about all the details. He told them about the false ceiling, the empty space in the corner, and all the other details. Smarto's confession had literally changed the security measures in all U.S. banks. They stopped using false ceilings in bank vaults, and all the dead corners have been eliminated. This was honestly one of the most distinct robberies in U.S. history. We have come to the end of the video. Don't forget to subscribe for more incredible stories.